Welcome, everyone. We're so happy you're here tonight. I'm Julie Massey, Associate Vice President for Mission and Student Affairs. And I'm happy to have you join us for this third lecture in a series that we've had across this academic year, um, uh, our year with the St. John's Bible. We've had um, three different lectures that have been considering um, the idea of scripture and illumination and physics, our lecture in October, and all sorts of different things um, that have sort of in one way or another connected to the idea of um, the illuminated manuscript of the St. John's Bible. And tonight I'm excited because uh, we're, we're bringing this back home to our Norbertine story. Um, and so it's, I'm really happy that Mission and Student Affairs and the Center for Norbertine Studies together uh, is bringing you this lecture. And I'm very happy to invite up my colleague, Dr. Rosemary Sands, who will We'll introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Division of Mission and Student Affairs and the Center for Norbertine Studies, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Heather Waka, University of Wisconsin Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for Medieval Studies. She will be speaking with us tonight on the 13th Century Archives at the Abbey of Premontre, Material Practices in the Scriptorium. As many of you know, Premontre was where St. Norbert and his followers settled in the spring of 1120 and where the Norbertines made their first professions on Christmas Eve of 1121. Dr. Waka holds an MA and a PhD in medieval history from the University of Iowa. Her research focuses on women's economic activities during the 12th and 13th centuries in Picardy, France, and incorporates material evidence found in the documents she uses as primary sources namely charters and cartularies. And you'll be hearing more about cartularies in a moment. She has worked extensively with the cartulary of the Abbey of Premontre, has published articles and given presentations on it, and is currently working on a critical print and digital edition of the same, forthcoming this year or early next year. In addition to her research on cartularies and medieval manuscripts, Dr. Waka has worked on multiple digital humanities collaborations, including La Beculae Vivae, Vivae, Vivae. I was practicing my Latin that I don't know, um, and I didn't pass the class, sorry. <laughs> or, the, or the Library of Stains project, which is just what one would imagine it to be, a project analyzing stains such as candle wax, blood, wine, medicinal spills, insects, etc., found on manuscripts. In addition, she works on a cartography and code project and is the associate editor of Virtual Mappa. Dr. Waka also teaches courses at the University of Wisconsin, among them a course on the history of the book. My first introduction to Heather was through her series of online videos entitled If Books Could Talk, produced while she was a graduate student at the University of Iowa. There are six short episodes and a bonus outtakes episode all of which merit binge watching. They're really great. You can find them through a link on her blog, hgwaka.wordpress.com, and you can contact me later for that address again, or on YouTube. So you can just Google if books could talk on YouTube and you should be able to find them. After discovering her online and finding out that she had done extensive research on the cartulary of Premontre, I invited her to SNC in October of 2016 to discuss further collaborative efforts. And here we are today, two plus years later. I'm so delighted. We are honored to have Dr. Waka at St. Norbert College to share her research of Premontre. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much, Rosemary, both for the invitation to speak tonight and for the very nice introduction. It's really nice to be back at St. Norbert's. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to thank Meredith Hansen and Martha Kedrowski, who have organized all the logistical arrangements and made me feel extremely welcome here. As Rosemary said, one of the current projects that I'm working on is the forthcoming publication of the 13th century cartulary of the Abbey of Prémontré, the founding abbey of the Premonstratensian Order, and I'm delighted to be able to share this cartulary with you tonight. 
The project, which is a collaboration between Dr. Yvonne Seal at SUNY Geneseo, has also been made possible through the work and support of the many wonderful librarians and archivists who've not only preserved the Carcellary Manuscript and much of the original archives of Prémontré, but have also shown great patience and generosity with requests to see and photograph these original documents over the last five years. So all the photos of original sources that you see tonight here are thanks to them. The Middle Ages produced some beautiful illuminated manuscripts, but the Carcellary of Prémontré is not one of them. <laughs> Despite its less than stunning appearance, this manuscript has an incredibly rich narrative to tell us about the people who were involved in its construction and in its conservation over the last 780 years. A narrative that is told both through the Carcellary's textual content, but also through its material makeup. The materiality of a manuscript can provoke an overwhelming sense of immediacy that arises when you realize that you are only inches away from centuries old ink, and by extension, the feather quill from which that ink flowed, and by extension, the hand of the person that held that quill. As a physical object, the Carcellary of Prémontré embodies a tangible link between the people who've handled it over the last eight centuries and the people who interact with it today. While sheer proximity to these materials, the materiality of the manuscript, can draw us nearer to an imagined past, the study of the material evidence can reveal important factual information about the historical context that surrounded the manuscript's construction and the people who participated in it. So to clarify a little bit of what I mean here, I have an example from my childhood. I'm not medieval. I am a medievalist, but I'm not from the Middle Ages. When I was a child and I visited my grandmother's house in north central Nebraska, the first thing I would do as soon as I arrived would be to grab my grandmother's hand and go into the far corner bedroom, the pink bedroom as it was called, sit her down on the vanity stool and open the cedar chest. My grandmother had been born in 1907 in a sod house in the middle of the Nebraska sandhills. And the cedar chest held a treasure trove of objects that linked me through her to the great-great-grandparents and the great-grandparents that I never knew, as well as to the countries from which my family had immigrated. My grandmother and I would take out each object and she would tell me its story, where it had come from, how she'd acquired it, what it represented, and I would soak up those stories over and over as if I were hearing them for the first time. In many cases, it was her person and her stories that made the visceral connection between me and my 18th and 19th century family. Now with my grandmother gone, only the objects remain, but the objects themselves still continue to tell their own stories. Similarly, the people who were alive at the Abbey of Prémontré in the 13th century may be long gone, but some of their manuscripts and documents survive to tell their own stories. While medieval historians often rely on the textual content of books and documents to construct their narratives of the past, the text itself is only part of the story. Another part of the story can be found in the material evidence that survives. So midway through that cedar chest ritual, my grandmother and I would always fall upon these two objects my great-grandfather's invitation to my great-grandmother asking her out on their first date, and her response. These two objects, like all pre-print uh, pre era manuscripts and documents, are handwritten. But because they are in English, we will naturally be drawn to read the text to gain a glimpse of, glimpse of my great-grandparents. And while this is an important pathway to their stories, if we were to leave aside what the text says for a moment, focus instead on the style of the writing, the size of the paper, the quality of the paper, the layout of the text, we can gain added information through the material evidence of the people who wrote these letters. My great-grandfather and his sort of scratchy, almost rushed hand, and my great-grandmother <laughs> with her carefully crafted penmanship and her choice to use watermarked paper. So likewise, even though the text of the Carcellary of Prémontré is predominantly in Latin, a language that many people no longer read, we can still read the material traces 
that the cartulary retains, traces that speak to the environment in which it was made and the people who played a hand in its construction. So tonight, I would like to introduce you not only to the cartulary of Prémontré, but also to some of its main characters. When we think of medieval book production, we almost inevitably think of a man hunched over a desk, copying away the scribe. However, it's important to note that several recent scholars have shown that women also worked in book, produ book production during the Middle Ages as scribes, painters, and binders. So, while we know that it was not unusual for women to be involved in making books, and we know that the Premont's retention order had female houses in the 13th century, I will be referring to the persons involved in the construction of the cartulary of Prémontré using male pronouns tonight, since we are as certain as we can be that this book was composed at the Abbey of Prémontré itself, which was a male community at that time. In the first part of tonight's talk, I want to provide a brief historical backdrop for the Cartulary of Prémontré and talk just a little bit about what a Cartulary is and what, is what, what function it serves. In the second part, I want to focus more on the material evidence found in the Cartulary to get a sense of the people involved in its construction and what they can tell us through their work with the manuscript about the Abbey's historical context in the 13th century. So, the scene <laughs> is one with which I know many of you are already very familiar. As stated in two charters, in 1120, Bartholomew of Jure, then Bishop of Laon, and Norbert of Xanten set off to survey several potential sites for the establishment of Norbert's new church. They settled upon a site of a small chapel at the confluence of three rivers about a day's ride west of the city of Laon. Bartholomew negotiated the transfer of the chapel from the Abbey of Saint Vincent de Laon to Norbert, securing the building that would become known as the First Church of Prémontré. By around 1200, the Prémontré retentions were second in size only to the Cistercians, and you can see from the map here the extent of their foundations in medieval Francophone areas alone. The Abbey buildings have since undergone several transformations. Here is what they looked like just before the Revolution in 1784. And I highlight this part right here, which is what is believed to have been the second church of Prémontré, dating to the early 12th century, as it looked in 1784. And this is what remains of the church today. In addition to the survival of the abbey buildings, much of the abbey's medieval archives also survive. But as with all monastic institutions in France, Prémontré was closed down after the French Revolution in 1789, and its archives were dispersed to multiple newly formed institutions. Today, these archives include over 500 12th and 13th century loose parchment charters, as well as the abbey's 13th century cartulary, divided among six different archives and libraries. So what exactly are these documents and what do they look like? So let's start with a charter. A typical medieval charter looked like this. It was written on a piece of loose parchment and often had a seal attached at the bottom. The charters from the archives of Prémontré principally concern papal or episcopal privileges, confirmation of possessions, property exchanges, or the resolution of disputes. This particular charter states that in 1231, Elizabeth of Flavie gave up her rights over a certain woods so that her nephew, Robert, who had inherited half of the Flavie lordship and his wife, Johanna, could donate these same woods to Prémontré. In its early form, a charter would have included a list of witnesses in front of whom the transaction had taken place. And these testimonies gave the charter its legal status. Here, for example, underlined in red, you can see how the witnesses were mentioned at the end of the charter. The witnesses did not sign the charter themselves, but rather the scribe would read the charter out loud, the witnesses would give their verbal assent, and the scribe would include their names at the bottom of the document. As an aside, witness lists are also where we gain insight into a person's character or trade. For example, here, uh, we might wonder if Albert was unusually tall. Albert, giant, Albert the Giant, or if his patronymic had just been passed down from previous generations. In other Prémontré charters, we have evidence of shoemakers, millers, 
and even jesters. Over the course of the 12th and 13th centuries, however, charter making became more formalized and the juridical validity of a document shifted from witness testimony at the end of a charter to clearly articulating the authority before whom a charter was issued and sealed at the beginning of the charter. And these authorities were often religious, such as an abbot or a bishop. But we also have evidence of several charters issued by secular authorities, such as the counts and countesses of Vermandois and the lords and ladies of Cousy and other regional nobles and lesser nobles. The increased production of these single loose leaf parchment charters in the 11th through the 13th centuries meant that over the course of decades, a religious institution could accumulate thousands of pieces of parchment. And this prompted institutions like the Abbey of Prémontré to create organizational systems in order to preserve the charters for the sake of security and accessibility. The problem of access and disorganized archives was not unique to Prémontré. Indeed, in the prologue to his 1238 carcellary, Jacques de Troyes, Archdeacon of the Cathedral Chapter of Law and the future Pope Urban IV, explicitly complained of the consequences of archival disorganization and neglect. Because, all too easily, the charters pertain to things possessed in common, and for this reason the aforesaid privileges and other charters have disappeared due to such neglect. And it has been the policy that the charters be diligently kept enclosed under the strict guardianship of three keys in the hands of two or three canons, so that now no one knows how many charters are kept behind these keys. Evidence from contemporary texts suggest that institutions organize their charters into boxes, bags, coffers, and bookcases. Each institution had its own system. In some instances where archival inventories survive or a substantial, uh, substantial number of the charter's dorsal markings, the, what's written on the back of the charter, uh, remain, scholars can decipher the methodology behind a particular institution's archival organization. And in the case of Prémontré, the backs of the charters often have a capital letter, usually A through G, indicating that they were probably kept either in marked bundles or on marked shelves according to author or geographical classification. When a religious institution's archives became unwieldy, due to the large number of accumulated charters. The abbey or monastery would often undertake construction of a cartulary, a book comprised of copies of those charters. Sometimes this book contained copies of all the charters that had been held to that, up to that point in the archives, but more often than not, it contained only some of the charters, a selection of charters. A cartulary was a means for institutions cons to consolidate their important charters into one place, and as a single object, it traveled much easier than a chest or a cupboard full, cupboard full of charters, and especially in times where there was threat of war or fire. Once an institution had decided to construct its cartulary, a cartulary maker might be appointed to oversee the project. And this is the person who would have selected and organized what he or she thought to be the most important charters for inclusion in the cartulary. For Prémontré, I have estimated that there were over 1,000 charters um, that the Abbey had accumulated by the time that the cartulary was being made, and only around half of those were copied into the cartulary. The process of constructing a cartulary differs from that of constructing a single charter. A single charter usually involved gathering together all the parties involved in the transaction alongside the witnesses, and a scribe would have written up the transaction in rough, read it aloud for all to consent to, and then written an official copy and attached to seal if one was to be had. And sometimes, all this activity took place in the same room at the same time, but sometimes it took months as in the case of this charter from Prémontré from 8, 1166, in which Gautier, a knight of Crépy, a Mensa and his wife, and Marguerite, his daughter, had given various lands and ties to the church of Prémontré, quote, publicly in front of a multitude of people at the church of Crépy, end quote. But the then Bishop of Laon had not been present at the Church of Crépy for the occasion, and thus required some kind of confirmation that the verbal affirmations had indeed been stated publicly before issuing his own version of the charter. 
Thus, Gautier, the knight in question, and his daughter Marguerite traveled from Crepy to one of the bishop's residences in Anisy-le-Chateau and repeated their donation in front of the bishop himself. Later, Garin, a priest from Crepy, traveled to see the bishop, who was by then back in Laon, to act as the voice of Gautier's wife, who was not able to travel at the time. All the logistical details were recorded in the charter itself, exemplifying how charter making could be a peripatetic activity, but inevitably required a number of participants. The construction of a cartulary also involved a lot of people, but a different set of people. It was a collaborative project that needed an overseer, what we might call today a project manager, <laughs> Scribes, correctors, rubricators, illuminators, and binders, each with their specific technical expertise. By the time a scribe sat down to begin copying charters into a new cartulary, the questions regarding content layout, folio, structure, and audience would have already been considered. While charters and cartularies contain the same kind of information, a cartulary only holds the transcribed copies of a selected group of original charters. And this does not mean that once copied into the cartulary, the original was discarded. No, in fact, a religious institution often maintained and preserved its archives even after a cartulary had been constructed, since in the eyes of a medieval jurist, the original held more juridical value due to the presence of a seal. The original charters could always be called upon to support the cartulary copies when rights, privileges, or transactions were challenged. In fact, I'll be discussing in a few minutes here a dispute that happened in 1158 at Prémontré where it seems that the brothers did just that. Archives filled with loose parchment charters coexisted with cartularies, each fulfilling a different set of needs for a religious institution. It is very rare, however, for a substantial number of charters from an institution's original archives to survive today, and Prémontré is one of only a handful of institutions in Picardy that have both a large number of surviving charters, as well as a corresponding cartulary. The cartulary of the Abbey of Prémontré is today held in the Municipal Library of Soissons. The manuscript measures about 15 and a half inches by 11 and a half inches. It's about this size. It's always bigger when I go back to look at it. It's always bigger than I remember. So it's a big, it's a big manuscript and is bound in brown sheepskin leather over pasteboard. A general overview of the chronology begins with the Abbey of Prémontré accumulating loose parchment charters as early as its foundation in 1120. The cartulary project took place over 100 years later in the 1230s and was completed by 1240. So although the cartulary manuscript has a date of 1240, it holds copies of charters from the previous 120 years. While it may have been bound shortly after its construction, its current binding dates to the late 16th or early 17th century, post-dating the completion of the cartulary by about 400 years. Readers from the late 13th to the 17th centuries added charters and notes like these in a variety of hands. They usually appear in the margins or in blank spaces and folios at the end of a section. We know these editions were written before the cartulary was bound for the last time as they are, as they have always, as they're always cut off and they were always cut off when the binder cropped the folios to fit the current binding. There's also evidence of late 18th, early 19th century foliation and marginal notes, probably done shortly before or after the revolution when the Abbey archives were being prepared for their new institutions. And here you can kind of see, um, you can see up here how the folio was cropped. And when that happened, the actual number of the folio was also taken away. So that's why they've put this in. And this is very much a eight, late 18th, 19th century writing, as well as this little summary down here at the same time, was done at the same time. Um, <clears throat> the cartulary holds over just 500 charters written on 113 parchment folios. The integral part of the cartulary was written by a single scribe in a beautiful uniform Gothic script, as you can see here. 
And this table shows an overview of the Carcellary's contents and organization. If we set aside the 18 undated charters and the 42 additions made in the 14th century and later, we're left with 447 charters. And of these, the first 45 are papal bulls, followed by 17 episcopal and 13 acts issued by the lords and ladies of Cousy, an important seigneurial family whose seat of power was very close to Premontre. The remaining 372 acts deal largely with transactions between Premontre and its surrounding religious and secular communities. These acts are grouped according to episcopal diocese, diocese in which they held properties. So you have the Diocese of Laon, you have the Diocese of Soissons, and then the Diocese of Noyon, each of which had its own table of contents in the carcellary. At the end of the carcellary is a short general section on just rights and privileges. The carcellary section for the Diocese of Laon is unique in that its charters are subdivided into Premontre's dependent houses or courtes in Latin. From these tables, we can imagine that the carcellary text with its diversity of charters comprises a rich repository of information for the social, economic, and religious history of Premontre during this period. As a physical object, the carcellary also provides material clues as to where and how it was made. It was probably begun under the auspices of Abbot Conrad, who initiated its construction sometime around 1230. But it was Abbot Hugh III, formerly, formerly Conrad's secretary and librarian, who would have seen it to its completion. The dates of the latest charters for many sections fall under Conrad's tenure, suggesting that initial phase of carcellary construction. And the very latest dates fall under Hugh III's tenure as abbot. Hugh was also involved in the completion of several building projects that Conrad had begun, including renovations of the library, the dormitory, the abbot's rooms, and the infirmary. The efforts of both men produced a sizable medieval manuscript library for the abbey's use, and perhaps an updated scriptorium that would have eased the pr practical aspects of manuscript production. Although the scriptorium at the Abbey of Prémontré no longer exists, it may have resembled something along the lines of this, the scriptorium at the monastery of Fonte Avellana in Italy. I'll just point out how wonderful this would have been for a scribe to work in. Um, you, they probably would have been, in these little recesses here, there probably would have been a desk that the scribe was working at and then would have had this natural light coming through. And not only that, though, they've accommodated for even more natural light with this extra set of windows along the top, and you've got this very nice high ceiling. With the picture of this scriptorium in mind, we can imagine that the one at Prémontré would have likely contained a cupboard or two or a chest or two filled with charters and manuscripts. To construct the carcellary, charters must have been taken out of the cupboards or chests, perused, selected, organized, and prepared in some kind of fashion so that the scribe would only have to take a group of charters at a time and begin copying them into the carcellary in the order in which they were, they were prepared and then perhaps replace them back in the archives. So who was this person who selected and organized the content of the carcellary? For lack of a better translation for the French word cartulariste, I will call this person the cartulary's overseer. No corroborating evidence survives to tell us the name of this person or why he organized the cartulary the way he did or how long the project took. The answers to these questions, if they are to be had, must come from the cartulary itself. While we know that the Carcellary project was likely initiated and completed during the time of Conrad and Hugh III, we cannot assume that they played a role in its construction. What we do know is that prior to Carcellary construction, the archives of the charters at Prémontré had undergone some form of organization, at least for the charters that appear in the section of the Diocese of Laon. Indeed, as you see here again, the houses in the Diocese of Laon are laid out in a particular order, starting with Soupir and ending with Hanap. Now, it's not unusual to see carcellaries that use geographical classification as a principle of organization. Often, however, when we see this principle at work, the sequence of named locations reflects the order of the locations as dictated in the papal inventories. <coughs> 
documents in which a pope lists and confirms all of an abbey's possessions. Premontre's cartulary contains four copies of papal inventories, one for Honorius II, one for Celestine II, one for Eugenius III, and one for Clement III. All of these inventories list and confirm Prémontré's possessions in more or less the same order. But instead of following the order of properties as stated in the inventories, the cartulary of Prémontré follows a different order, at least for the properties found in the Diocese of Lens. An order which is laid out in an 1158 charter resolving a dispute between the then Bishop of Lens, Gautier de Mortagne, and the Church of Prémontré. Bishop Gautier had accused his two predecessors, Bishop Bartholomew of Jour and Bishop Gautier of Saint-Maurice, of having unlawfully donated episcopal lands to Prémontré. Caught between a rock and a hard place, we can imagine the brothers of Prémontré rigorously sifting through their archives in 1158 to find those original charters, packing them up and taking them to the trial held in Lyon in order to justify their possession of said properties in front of the King of France, the Archbishop of Reims, the Bishops of Soissons and Noyon, and the entire cathedral chapter of Lyon. And after the trial, when the brothers returned to Prémontré, they may have taken advantage of this opportunity to organize, or perhaps even reorganize a bit, the entire archives. According to the properties, according to the order of the properties as listed in the 1158 resolution charter, because that is exactly the same order that appears in the cartulary today. And you'll see here that the, um, in the 1158 charter, there were properties in Cusi La Ville, and I, those are not that's not a section that's really accounted for in the cartulary, and I'm, I think it's because it was actually a set of charters that then went back into the section previously where there was all the Episcopal charters and the seigneurial charters of the Lords of Cousy, because that was their seat of power, Cousy la ville The possibility that the archives at Prémontré were organized according to a resolution of an 1158 dispute suggests that the Abbey had been greatly disturbed by the Bishop of Lens' challenges to their rightful goods and possessions. Moreover, the careful attention to archival organization for the Diocese of Lens, in which Prémontré is located, really highlights the disarray that appears in the rest of the cartulary. The Diocese of Soissons only has 28 charters compared to the 136 for the Diocese of Lyon and the 184 for the Diocese of Noyon. And this was not because there were no dependent houses in the Diocese of Soissons. We know that there were, as we have the original charters that survive from at least three of them. But none of these charters appear in the Cartulary of Prémontré. The Soissons section predominantly focuses on confirmations from the Counts of Soissons regarding Prémontré's holdings within their territories and two houses that Prémontré held in the town of Soissons, one in the area known as La Chaine and one that's always just called the house under the bishop's wall. As for, the Prémontré's, uh, as for Prémontré's properties in the Diocese of Noyon, there is an ample number of charters copied into the cartulary, but they are in no particular order, and they are certainly not divided into geographical locations. There is only the one table of contents for the entire section, and it lasts for about four or five folios. The lack of organization in the cartulary sections of Soissons and Noyon allude to a similarly disorganized archives somewhere. Were the charters of Soissons and Noyon even held at Prémontré at this time? It seems that if they had been, they would have been better organized in the archives and thus in the cartulary. Perhaps in the early 1230s, the cartulary overseer sent out a call for all charters, to, of, for all charters from the diocese of Soissons and Noyon to be delivered to Prémontré for inclusion in the Abbey's cartulary project and they only received those for the two houses of Soissons, proper, and a stack of unorganized charters from the main house of Bonneuil in the Diocese of Noyon. It may be that although the Abbey of Prémontré clearly held multiple houses and properties in these different dioceses, the charters for Soissons and Noyon were held locally and had to travel to Prémontré in order for the scribe to copy them into the cartulary. Since there is, of course, no uh, cooperating documentation that survives that discusses why the cartulary was organized this way. We can only posit a scenario in which that perhaps until 1240, there was a looser administrative structure that existed for the premonstratensian houses in the three dioceses discussed here, uh, 
where each diocese maintained its own archives and kept its charters close to home. Similarly, while it's very possible that the carcellary overseer and the carcellary scribe were two different people, we just simply cannot say if this is what happened at Prémontré or not. What we do know from the material evidence found in the carcellary is that one scribe was responsible for copying all of the carcellary charters. He read and wrote Latin well, he was invested in doing a good job, and he could easily have handled the organization of the carcellary should he have also been the overseer. Medieval scribes, in general, often worked within a scriptorium. They were uh, there, they would have likely sat at desks or tables at which they could conduct their work of writing. Perhaps there were scribal desks, desks at Prémontré, such as these here that we find in contemporary images. Or perhaps the brothers at Prémontré worked at tables similar to the one that we saw in the scriptorium at Fonte Avellana. While much of what medieval scribes produced survives in archives and libraries today, today very little information remains that talks about the material culture that supported their work and their working conditions. Thus, what we know of the scribe at Prémontré comes mainly from what he has written and how he has written it in the carcellary itself. But before we look closely at the carcellary scribe in person, it's important to imagine the setting in which he worked. So we can picture him at the beginning of a day's work. He'd probably already chosen a stack of ordered uh, charters, and he was planning to copy them that day. He probably placed them somewhere in close proximity to a big piece of carcellary parchment that he was going to work on. And he had probably placed a nice ink pot filled with iron gall ink close at hand, and perhaps an extra quill or two. So what the carcellary tells us is that the scribe was a well-practiced scribe. His hand is consistent and typical of an early to mid 13th century northern French Gothic script. Folio after folio after folio show great care and uniformity of script above all. The folios are evenly ruled with 45 lines per column, and as one folio is completed, the scribe continues on to the next without any disruption. This type of beauty is not easily accomplished, especially given that the Prémontré, uh, the Prémontré scribe was writing on parchment that was not of the highest quality. As can be seen in these examples, there are several folios where repairs were made in order not to waste a piece of parchment. Some holes, likely created during the process of parchment making, were never repaired, and the scribe just wrote around them. Given ideal working conditions, that is maybe like working six days a week for about six hours a day, the completion of the carcellary manuscript of 113 bifolios, such as the carcellary of Prémontré, could have been executed within three to four months. When I figured that out, I thought, gosh, I would have imagined that to be a much longer time. A general rate of about four folios per day. And this calculation is based on a 1995 study carried out by Michael Gullick, who surmised that a scribe probably could write about one line per minute. You can try it at home. Please do. Take your quill, take your iron gall ink, and see how far you get in a minute. External factors inevitably came into play. For example, the scribe would have had to stop to sharpen his quill from time to time. If he was making his own ink, he would have had to take time out to do that. If he got sick, he would have had to stay in bed. Moreover, it's important to consider the working conditions in 13th century northern France, for example, as opposed to the working conditions in 13th century southern Italy. And the winters in France can be extremely cold, with only a few hours of daylight. And it is possible that the Prémontré scribe copied into the early evening using candlelight, as there is evidence of a wax residue on folio 36R. But this may well just have come from a reader who was reading after dark centuries later. The conscientiousness that the scribe applied to his script and folio layout also appears in the accuracy of the textual content. He generally made very few copying mistakes. We know this to be true since several of the original charters survive. And when one compares the textual content of an original charter to the carcellary copy, the scribe was impressively meticulous. Where textual variants do occur, it's usually a case of the scribe updating the names of people and places to what he considered a standardized 1240 spelling. <coughs> 
For example, the scribe usually updated what was the Latin name for Raoul from the early to mid 12th century spelling, Radulfus with an F, to the 1240 spelling, Radulfus with a PH. Likewise, he updated, he updated the Latin spelling of the place named Cusilaville from the 12th century Cosi Villa to the 13th century Cusi Villa. Where other scribes in other circumstances have sometimes chosen to adapt the actual textual content of a charter to reflect contemporary understandings, the Prémontré scribe remained faithful to the charters he was copying. He copied only what was in the original as closely as possible and rarely made any additions, however minor. His dedication and meticulousness suggests that he was very aware of the significance of the work that he was doing and that his efforts to create accurate, uniform transcriptions reflect Prémontré's expectations of what a cartulary was meant to be in the mid-13th century, as well as an institutional understanding of how a culture, uh, cartulary could shape or could be shaped to represent institutional agendas and values. While some medieval scribes copied works without knowing much Latin at all, that is not the case with the cartulary scribe at Prémontré. He was well versed in Latin and clearly understood the content of the charters he was copying. He was also capable of writing his own commentary from time to time. These moments are rare in the cartulary and uh, this makes them all the more intriguing when they do happen. So, for example, in Carcellary Act 296, the scribe adds a text at the end of the Carcellary copy that states, quote, this charter is held in two places, word for word and sealed, but it's written here in only one place, end quote. And we are fortunate that the two original charters that the scribe was referring to still survive. Moreover, we know that he used the charter on the left as his model, since this is the one that matches most closely the text in the Carcellary copy. And the charter on the right contains some small variations that were not copied into the cartulary. Act 368, the scribe just says that the rest of this charter is exactly as it is in the previous entry. It was quite common actually to see multiple charters of the same transaction copied into a cartulary, but usually each would have been issued by a different authority and often included different pieces of information. In Act 133, the scribe inserts his own words into the text, saying that the rest of this particular charter has already been copied at the end of the preceding section, word for word, and thus he had decided not to copy it again here. While he likely wanted to save space, since parchment was expensive, it's as likely that he wanted to save the labor of copying out the same text again. So in these instances where the scribe has inserted his own voice in the charter text, they are incredibly rare, but they offer insight not only into scribal practice, but also the sense of confidence that the Prémontré scribe must have, had, must have felt in order to be comfortable enough to make independent decisions such as these. However well-trained and well-intentioned, the scribe at Prémontré was only human, after all, and like any human, he did make mistakes. Throughout the cartulary, the scribe makes small, unintentional spelling mistakes or omits a word from time to time demonstrating his human imperfection and the uniqueness of every handwritten document. For example, in Cartulary Act 264, he omits in the cartulary copy a word that was in the original charter. And it goes right there where the purple star is, is where it should have gone. And in Act 270, he does exactly the same thing. In Act 310, he not only omits the word annuatum, or annually, he also omits entire lines all by accident. Everything in bold here has been left out of the cartulary copy. And this is actually an excellent example of what is called homeo teluton. A mistake that happens when you are copying something and then your eye skips from one word on one line to the same word on a different line in the text and you take up your copying from there. So you can see here where the scribe read noviomensis in the first instance. And instead of carrying on from that point, when he went back, he saw this Novia Mensis and just carried on from that point. And he then, of course, omitted everything in between. In Act 472, we see another case of Homeo Teluton. The scribe has left out all the text that is underlined on the left in the original charter. He stopped here at the word capitulum, did his copying here, went back, skipped this, saw this capitulum instead, and started copying again. So all of this bit here 
is left out. Errors were part and parcel of manuscript production, and procedures were already set in place to accommodate for them. Often a corrector would go through a text after it had been copied to make sure that the, uh, that the copy was actually true to the original, because introducing errors was something to be avoided at all costs. Um, if, they had not, if they were not caught, they could prove to have long-term effects on later copies of copies of copies, and this could go on and on and on. For the Cartulary of Prémontré, it appears that the scribe was making corrections to the text as he was copying, in other words, charter by charter. The Cartulary shows evidence of two principal types of corrections, one in which dots are placed, this was common practice, uh, under a letter or a word to indicate that something needed to be omitted. So here you can see that these four words shouldn't actually be there. And those dots, that's what those dots are saying. And here, these two words shouldn't be here, and that's what the dots underneath are saying. The other type of correction used is what looked, or what actually looks like quotation marks to us to indicate incorrect word order, or what's called transposition. And you can, it's really hard to see, but there they are, one's there and one's there, which indicates that this word is not in the right order. It probably is supposed to go after Felicus. And here, same thing, quotation marks, this is Maritus Robertus Aeus, and it was never ever said that way. It was always said Robertus Aeus Mari, Mari, Maritus or Robertus Maritus Aeus. So in any case, this one is out of order. When a scribe realized he'd left out an entire section of a text on folio 73R, he made a little sign indicated here in the upper right corner to alert the reader to look for more text elsewhere indicated in the left margin. And we do this same thing today with a hashtag when we are still writing longhand and not composing on a computer. And you can see on the left how he repeats the sign here. Here's the little sign says go here. Here it is again. Continue on. Uh, and this type of evidence shows that the scribe was acting not only as the scribe, but as the corrector. And oftentimes, these were two separate roles. Two separate people would do this in manuscript production. So it's really interesting that the scribe is not only a scribe, he's also correcting his work. Before moving on, though, I would also like to offer one more glimpse into the scribe as a human being. So when I first began studying this cartulary, I realized that there was a set of cartulary charters, acts numbered 395 to 401 that had been duplicated later on in the cartulary as Acts 439 to 445, but in reverse order. And so this, I sat with this for like two years, okay? It was so puzzling to me because everything I knew about the scribe made me think that he would never make a mistake like this. And why were they copied in reverse order? So since the scribe has left us no account as to why this happened, I knew that if the answer were to be found, I'd have to go back to the material analysis. So I came across a probable scenario when I went back to the cartulary and consulted the actual folios on which Acts 395 and 4 or 401 were copied. Do you see it? <laughs> the clue is in the large stain on folio 96R, right in the middle of Act 398 and the beginning of Act 399. Then, when I consulted the two surviving originals of these seven duplicated charters, my hypothesis was confirmed because both charters also had these large ink stains indicating a more extensive accident that even I had imagined. So my hypothesis is best explained in a little short video that I have, but I have to forewarn you that this is very much a home video. And uh, I have to thank my downstairs neighbor for being so kind as to act as videographer. So if you will indulge me, I will take you back to 1240, to the day of the spill in the scriptorium of Prémontré. So before I say anything, I'm just gonna set the scene. What we have here is, um, a stack of charters, and this is how I kind of know that he was working in stacks of charters. Then you have some ink over here, and right here, un you can't, it's hard to see because my arm is in the way, but under here is the actual folio, the cartulary folio that he would have been working on. And so I'm just gonna kind of narrate this as we look at it. 
So there's the scribe copying Charter 398, or 395, 396, 397. When he's done, he puts it in a pile, one on top of the other. Oh my goodness, big ink spill happens, right? Oh no, what am I gonna do? So I've gotta move the charters around to get the ink off them, to let them dry out. He's moving the charters all over, separating them. This is like not in his normal workflow. He's mopping up all of the ink here. And he's gonna let them dry. And he's gonna put them back in what he thinks is, you know, the right order. And he's gotta still copy a few of them. So he takes the ones he hasn't copied or finished, continues copying 398, 399, 400, 401. Great. And then he's got this stack of charters now that are in reverse order. And what's he gonna do with that stack? It's obviously not going over to the left where he puts all of the charters that he's already copied. For some reason, he puts it over in another pile where close to the copies that he has yet to do. He leaves it there. He continues the next day, maybe two or three days later. He grabs the stack as if it's not been done yet. He sets it in front of him and he's gonna start working on 401. He copies it. Then he sees 400, he copies it. 399, he copies it, not recognizing that he's already done these exact same charters before. And this is the only possible scenario that actually could have taken place. So what that material evidence and reenactment tells us is that because the scribal workflow was disrupted due to an accident, a set of seven charters were duplicated in reverse order later in the cartulary. And the reverse order of the duplicated charters also confirms that the scribe was working with these sort of stacks of charters and placing them one on top of the other as he finished copying them. Not only does this type of analysis help us understand the cartulary organization, but it also places us immediately into the material world and workflow of the scribe demonstrates how the disruption could impact not only the day of the scribe, but also the contents of the cartulary. So from evidence provided by the cartulary, we know that this single scribe undertook copying of all 507 charters. He also acted as the regulator of his own work and corrected his transcriptions as he wrote them. His was a well-trained hand and he was attentive to detail and he made Herculean efforts to accurately transcribe the text of his charters. As a human being, we also know he made mistakes and he perhaps got angry with himself on that day when that pot of ink accidentally spilled onto all his charters and his work. So while he may have aspired to perfection, like all of us, he wrestled with the qualities that make us human. The scribe at Prémontré had not finished his duties after copying and correcting the text. We know that he was also the cartulary's rubricator. Again, a situation where oftentimes someone was the scribe, someone was a corrector, and someone was a rubricator. And if there was going to be a doubling up, it was always the corrector and rubricator. It was not one person doing all of the work. But here we have one person doing all of the work. In the world of book production, the person who went over a text after it was completely copied and filled in the parts that needed red ink was called the rubricator from the Latin rubrum for red. Rubrics are very common in long medieval texts. The red ink is used to highlight the beginnings of new chapters or sections of text and offer a reader easy access to a textual hierarchy that could otherwise be lost amidst a sea of black ink. The rubricator was often someone other than the scribe and in this capacity he or she could also act as the corrector. But for the cartulary of Prémontré, it's very clear that the scribe is also the rubricator. The rubrication is in the same hand as the scribe. And you can just see it here when you look at the Sancti Nicolai and down here, it's the same, it's, I mean, it's the same hand. As the scribe worked his way through the cartulary, inserting the rubrication, he also took the opportunity to strike through any of those corrections that he had made or indicated using the dots. And that's why you often see the dots and then this red line that goes through that he did when he was doing the rubrications. When the scribe composed his rubrics, he was not copying a prescribed summary as other rubricators often did. He was not copying the short summaries found on the backs of original charters, nor was he copying the charter summary that he had written for the table of contents at the beginning of each section. <laughs> 
so here you can see that in, in black the charter summaries that have been taken from the table of contents for the House of Soupir in the Diocese of Laon. And directly underneath it in purple is the charter summary that appears at the beginning of the copied charter. In red you see these small changes such as in number one where the table of contents mentions an alms gift of Soupir, but the summary notes that the gift was made by Baudouin of Soupir. And again, in number four, you see in the table of contents, it says that the bishop confirms, but in the charter summary, it actually says that this is the Bishop Anselm of Laon. In number six, the table of contents discusses the altar um, and tithe of Soupir, whereas the charter summary notes the altar and the third part of the major tithe of Soupir. So the Prémontré scribe seems to have mastered the art of composing a charter summary that filled but did not overfill the space that he had left out or that he had left for it. The folio layout of the cartulary also hints at the age of the scribe. While he copied his text in a Gothic script that dates to the early mid uh, 13th century, there are aspects of the folio's layout that hark back to an earlier style. As you can see here, in the right margin of the folio, there are a series of small holes, and these are called pricking marks that were used to rule the folio. The pricking marks were made on both sides of a folio, and a line was drawn between them in order to create a horizontal ruling for the writing. You can also see here that the first pricking mark, thus the first line of text, is noted by an arrow. When a line is drawn from that mark across the right column, the scribe has entered the first line of text above the ruling line. And this was a practice that had mostly become obsolete by 1230. And remember, the scribe is working in 1240. After 1230, most scribes were writing their first lines of text below the first ruling line, not above it. And it would make sense then that as an older scribe, he had been trained in an earlier practice and was carrying that practice through to 1240. And if this were the case, it might also explain how in the rubricated summary of Act 283, and this is the rubricated summary right there, the scribe expanded the initial G, which is found in the text of the charter, into Godefredi, or Jeffroy, or Jeffrey. How did the scribe know? that the vineyard was called the vineyard of Geoffrey Shoemaker and not George Shoemaker or Gerard Shoemaker. The original charter was recorded in 1183 and in 1240, 60 years later, the scribe was still able to remember the name of this person or at least knew of him, which again suggests perhaps an older person. With an understanding that the scribe played the principal role in the construction of the cartulary, it becomes more plausible to entertain the idea that he may have also been the cartulary's overseer. He was perhaps an older brother, trained in an earlier manuscript production tradition. He was certainly familiar with Latin and the charters and the possessions of Prémontré. And the cartulary evidence paints a picture of an experienced and capable scribe, perhaps the overseer, but as we will see, his skills did not extend to being an artist. One of the most perplexing aspects concerning the cartulary of Prémontré is what appears to be its unfinished state. Many of the manuscripts from this time period display large capital letters alongside the rubricated summaries to reinforce the textual hierarchy and display the artistry involved in creating a beautiful manuscript. The insertion of decorated or illuminated initials or capital letters would have taken place after the transcription of the text was finished, after the corrections, and after the rubrication. For northern France, decorated capitals often alternated between red and blue. And what remains puzzling here is that the cartulary of Prémontré was clearly intended to receive this treatment, but it never did. The scribe left space enough to hold a large first letter and even wrote in the initial that was meant to be drawn. So here you can see a really tiny A. That means that there should have been a lovely, beautiful A here for the word Alexander. And here you can see a really tiny U. This should have been a beautiful, uh, decorated U here for Urbanus, the first word. Contemporary 13th century manuscripts that belonged to the, uh, the Abbey of Prémontré at the time of the Revolution provide insight as to what might have been had the cartulary been finished. This is a 13th century copy of a Psalter with a lovely capital E in blue with red highlights, and you can also see the rubric just next to it. 
On the left here is a religious treatise, again with lovely alternating red and blue capitals. And here you can see that the scribe left two lines to draw them in the same number of lines left in the Cartulary of Prémontré. And on the right, if the letters were not to be too elaborate, they might have looked like this, again with the alternating blue and red. So we can only posit speculation as to why the Cartulary was never finished. But it's important to remember that this book was not made for display, nor was it made for daily use. It was made for the brothers themselves, and mostly as a means of safeguarding the memory of the Abbey's holdings and possessions. In this case, it does not need decoration as a display of wealth or status, although it was clearly intended to have some kind of decorated initials similar to the ones found in the manuscripts here. It may be that the lack of decoration is a signal that the scribe, corrector, rubricator, all the same person, had reached the end of his contributions and needed to pass the book on to someone else more skilled in decoration. And if so, that person never materialized and the Cartulary of Prémontré returns to its narrative of a single man committed to completing as much of the Cartulary construction as possible before having to leave it for other work. Throughout this talk tonight, I've tried to emphasize that the textual content held in a medieval manuscript as material evidence can also be read for clues as to its construction. And in so doing, we've discovered leads that make us consider the administrative policies and structure at the Abbey of Prémontré, at least until 1240, and also the idea that the Abbey assigned the task of cartulary production to a single brother. One, who has shown throughout his work a deep understanding of his task in Prémontré and the ability to perform the multiple duties expected of him. The materiality of the cartulary is always the case when you study material evidence. It also leaves us with questions that have yet to be resolved. So why was the cartulary never finished? And was the cartulary overseer the same person as the scribe? I kind of want to say so, but I can't say so for sure because I just don't know. And why was the cartulary rebound in the late 16th, early 17th centuries? So I leave you tonight to decide for yourself if this last piece of evidence of material analysis or materiality that I'm going to show you in a minute helps you to gain more insight into the Carcellary and Abbey of Prémontré, or leaves you perhaps asking more questions. This is the only evidence of a partial fingerprint that could have been perhaps the scribe himself. Thank you. <laughs> That's the end. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. We have lots of questions, but I'm going to open it up to the room. Who has a question for Dr. Walker? Uh, yes. Is a separate person who prepared the skins? Yes, I think that would have been a separate person. And I don't, that is a really interesting question. And there are a lot of scholars that are working on this idea. We always assume that for large institutions like Prémontré, who did have large herds of animals, is documented, that they use their own animals. So they may have had brothers who were skilled in parchment making, or they may have had, um, they may have like sent it out to Long or somewhere else where there were parchment makers to have them make the parchment for the animals, their own animals. But we can't say for sure because there is other evidence that says that even abbeys as large as Prémontré were perhaps just buying their parchment from a parchment maker. So we're not quite sure, but I definitely do not think that scribes, scribes were not known Let's say that it took a lot of time and intense work to become a scribe, so I don't think they would have had the time to also master parchment making. Very Two very different uh, crafts. And I uh, heard a lecture where they talked that with scientific equipment now you can just about trace the herd. And That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. There's a, one of the most exciting things I've heard in the last year. Is there's a project that is coming out of York University, Matthew Collins, called the BioArc Project. And they're using non-invasive technologies for identifying the proteins of a piece of parchment. So you can go in on a, um, a manuscript, a medieval manuscript, you just take a little eraser and you're not really damaging it at all. But on that eraser, it catches a little bit of the hairs or proteins of the parchment. 
they go back, they analyze it from the protein analysis. They can tell you what kind of animal it was. And they did that for an entire manuscript. I think it was a Gospel of Luke. It's held at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And what they found was absolutely amazing. They found that there was this incredibly intricate pattern to the construction of this cartulary. So choir number one, two, three, and four all had the outside folio as goat and the inside folios as sheep or something like this. I mean, they were definitely intentional and purposeful, something we could have never known without that kind of technology. But it really is the cutting edge, bringing in some of the scientific technology into these manuscripts now to really advance our study and to really make what is invisible to the naked eye visible. Yeah, that's my bottle of ink. I was going to go over there and demonstrate something at one point in my talk, and then I just thought, no, I'm not. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hang out here for a little bit longer. Is that okay? <laughs> Any other questions? Are you more apt to find the illumination later in a time period and more on musical pages? Um. I don't, I don't think so. I think- We didn't see any here. Right, we didn't see any illuminations here, exactly. <coughs> this is not the kind of book, a cartulary, you're not going to invest a lot of money in illuminations. Mm -hmm. they, those would have been, they were making illuminations at this time, they were, they were making illuminations in the sixth century. So it's not necessarily the time period, I think it has much more to do with the genre of book and who the audience is. So if you've got, if you want to display your wealth and status, you will have a book that's made with lots of illumination and beautiful images, lots of gold leaf, et cetera, et cetera. Expensive pigments and dyes that would have gone into the colors. Um, but the cartulary, this is an administrative document. Okay. So, and just like the charters, they're administrative documents. You're not going to see a lot of illumination. And what did you say was the change from the red to the blue what indicated something that the change from the red, red ink to the blue ink indicated something. Mm, just the alternating initials. Yeah. That's very typical of northern France manuscripts, where you have those initials in color. Northern Europe, really. I have a question. So in the pages that you showed us where he had the little V and the little G. Yeah. That was a G, I think. A. I can't remember. A. A. How would that have been covered up with the illuminated letter? Yeah, it so would have not been going back in yeah. with their eraser and getting rid of it. No, no, they would have been. They put it off to the side a little bit, but it all, it would have been um, definitely covered up with like some kind of decorated leaf, yeah. filigree kind of filigree thing. And for the so the cartulary was an administrative book. And the charter, so I'm thinking with the, with the seal, the wax seal, it's, mm -hmm. you know, this is original, this is official, and the cartulary is a copy. Mm -hmm. So would they just use it internally or would they be able to use it externally to say I have, you know, I don't have to pay tolls on this road or I have right of passage for my animals or I have exemptions here? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's a couple of things at play there. I think if the original, if they have the original, they're going to use the original. It had to a 13th century mind, even a 14th century mind, probably even a 15th century mind, the original was the Holy Grail. That was the one that was going to really be your authentic version, and they were going to believe it. Cartularies, they wanted cartulary because they wanted to have a copy of all these charters because they were so valuable. But cartularies also served another function in the sense that when you chose which charters to put in, you created, you fashioned, you shaped an image of who you were. And so that in itself made the cartulary its own, gave the cartulary its own sense of value in the sense that here we have this document, look at who we are. We have all of these things. And uh, we'll put our foundation charters at the beginning. You'll see how we were founded. This is our story, et cetera, et cetera. And so they, were, they kind of serve different purposes. Um, 
But if you're talking about legal issues, the original would have been the pref preferred one. Good, thank you. Any other questions tonight? Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Walker again for that fascinating lecture. <laughs>